I'm just taking a minute to proof my announcements, make sure I get them right. Good evening. It's good to have everyone here this evening. If you are visiting with us tonight, we're so excited to have you as part of our congregation. See, we got some Dalreda folks with us. Good to have you. Uh, if you're able to and willing to, grab one of those visitor's cards from the back of the chair in front of you, fill that out, hand it to one of our church members. We'd like to know that you are with us today. You can also uh, use your smart device and do the QR codes on the screen there. Uh, a few announcements, and then I'll introduce Kyle to everyone. Uh, Jerry Stiff, he had a heart valve replacement procedure on Monday, and he is doing well. So that's wonderful news to hear that. There will be a widow and widower renaissance banquet on Saturday in the Fellowship Hall at 4 p.m. You need to RSVP to Kelly Davis or Beth Zamfir by Friday. Uh, if you are planning to bring a plus one, please let them know. Uh, in lieu of that, there will be a meeting down front following services for those interested in helping with the event. So directly after services this evening, uh, down front, I reckon over this side's good enough. Over here on my left, if you'll come down front uh, for that meeting. The McCullough Care Group luncheon will be on Sunday in the Fellowship Hall at 11.30 a.m. The menu is spaghetti, and the food sign-up sheet is posted on the bulletin board right out in the hallway if you want to have a look at that. For most everyone who's here, uh, you already know Kyle and what he means to us. He's really like family. Uh, I've been blessed to be able to attend congregations with Kyle at various times. We were, he may not even know it, but we were at Eastern Meadows at the same time way back in my college days a long, long, long time ago. And Eric reminded me a moment ago uh, that about 22, maybe 23 years ago, I was playing uh, basketball in Jana and Eric's pool with Kyle, and he was dunking over me and scratching me with his long talons. He's just a, just a beast. But uh, in other news about Kyle, he's been preaching for 25-plus years in the Brotherhood, always does a wonderful job everywhere that he goes. He's a graduate at Freed Hardman University. He's been working with Apologetics Press and the Bible Department uh, for over 24 years. Uh, he travels all over, as many of you know. He is an author of numerous books and video projects on Christian evidences. He's also, from time to time, uh, speaking in debates against some of the world-renowned atheists. His wife and he, uh, Bethany, they've been married for 24 years, and they have three children, Drew, Anna Claire, and Reed, and they currently live in Columbia, Tennessee, and we're excited to have Kyle with us this evening. We'll now be led in our opening prayer. Bow with me, please. Our great God in heaven, we thank thee for your love and for your blessings. We realize that you bless us so greatly each day with so much. We are a nation that has been blessed, and we're thankful for that. And we pray that we might continue in that way, even though there are so many going in a sinful direction that we would not be shocked if you decided to bring retribution upon us as a nation. We thank thee, Father, that you have given us your word that we can read it and understand it and know what you would have us to do to be pleasing to thee and to live forever with thee. We thank thee for that. We thank thee for Brother Butt and the things that he has done to uh, help the kingdom. And we thank thee that he is here with us tonight and pray that those things that he presents might be well received and might be applied in our lives. Be with us this evening. Help us to be attentive. We give you thanks, Father, for the, those who have had successful surgeries and and other things, and we pray that they might continue to uh, get better and soon be able to be back and join us. And it's in the name of thy son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Sure appreciate you, good brothers and sisters at Wetumpka. You guys have been such an encouragement to us at Apologetics Press. Such an encouragement to me and the many times I've gotten to be with you. Brent, 
left out a very important part of that basketball game, and that was who won. Uh, I'm not going to say who won because I don't remember, but it was 23 years ago. But yes, we have had some good times with Brent and, of course, Eric and Jana and so many of you guys and the work at AP just just so excited about your connection to us and the support that you give us and the encouragement and moral support that you give us, and I really appreciate it. Tonight's lesson is not fun. It's not one that you like in a whole lot of ways. It's not one that you get excited about, but it's one that has to be and needs to be preached. And here's why. Now, there's a guy by the name of Penn Gillette. He is a co-host on a, an HBO TV program where he supposedly debunks, well, lots of times he deals with magicians and things of that nature, and he shows people how to do it and shows it's not real magic. But then he extends that to religion and says, I'm going to debunk religion too. And he's an atheist who doesn't believe in God at all. But he's telling a story about how his show is always live, and after his live show, he will go into the audience and talk to people who were there in the audience. And this particular evening, and you can tell in his five-minute YouTube video, video, he's very vulnerable in this particular video. You can tell he's very emotional. And he says, after tonight's show, I had a man come up to me, looked me in the eye, shook my hand, and said, Hey, Penn, I really appreciated the show. Enjoyed getting to see a lot of the stuff on it. And he handed me a Bible. And he said, this has answers to a lot of stuff in my life. And Penn, if you read it and ever have any questions or if I can help you in any way, my name is right there in the front and so is my phone number and email address. Now, Penn Gillette said, a lot of the atheistic community would view that type of what he called proselytizing as offensive and can you believe these Christians are doing that kind of thing? But he said, I have never understood a person who calls himself or herself a Christian who would not try to convert other people. He said, because if you thought for one second that I was going to hell, and I would be in hell for all eternity, be suffering in pain, and you didn't try to get me out of that situation? His words were, how much would you have to hate a person not to try to help them end up in heaven and not in hell? That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? You know, one of the most unpopular sermon themes in any pulpit across the nation tonight or Sunday morning or Sunday night is the topic of hell. In fact, most people will not preach on hell. Most congregations will not accept preaching on hell. When Eric and I were doing an article on the eternality of hell that we were writing to combat some of the false teachings on hell, we were reading several articles, and one of the articles was from a, a lady pastor. Now, put that in quotations, but she was in New York City, and someone had asked her, would you ever preach on hell? And she said, no, I would never preach on hell. The congregation here just wouldn't accept that type of preaching, and that is mean-spirited, and I just wouldn't ever touch that subject. Now, I think you and I both understand, in Luke chapter 9, when Jesus said, whoever is ashamed of me... And my words in this sinful and corrupt or crooked or perverse generation of him, I will be ashamed before my Father in heaven. Now you start letting that sink in. And I think a lot of us in our minds think, oh, I'm all about Jesus. I love the teaching of doing to others as you want them to do unto you. Love the teaching of let brotherly love continue. Love the teachings that you find there in the Sermon on the Mount and how encouraging and good they are about not blowing a trumpet when you do good deeds and not letting your left hand know what your right hand is doing. But, but hell, eh, you know, the... Agnostic, Ber Agnostic Bertrand Russell, who was so famous several decades ago, he wrote an article titled, Why I Am Not a Christian. 
And in this article, he said there is one very serious defect in his mind to the character of Jesus Christ. And that is that Jesus talked about hell. You know, the word for hell, Gehenna, is mentioned 12 times in the New Testament. 11 times Jesus uses the word. The person who talked more about hell than any person in the New Testament is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Do you know if you're going to be standing with Christ and the personality of Christ and the teachings of Christ, one of those teachings that you're going to be standing lockstep with Jesus Christ on is the afterlife and the reality of hell. Now, like I said, it's not a pleasant subject. I volunteered in college, and it was at the, Char the Carl Perkins Child Abuse Prevention Center. And in order to volunteer, you had to go through this eight-hour presentation, and you had to get the certificate to say you had been through it. And one of the, it was about an hour or an hour and a half after they gave you all the rules and what you needed to do when you were transporting kids and what you could do, couldn't do, etc. Then they said, okay, in order for you to finish this, you have to watch this slideshow at the time. This was before PowerPoint. It was a slideshow. And it was a slideshow of pictures of children who had been abused and where a mom had taken a, an iron to the back of a four-year-old or a dad had taken a, an electrical cord to the legs of a seven-year-old and the whelps. And, the th and you just had to watch picture after picture after picture. And they explain to you that you need to see these things because it's one thing to realize, okay, these children are in a terrible situation. It's another thing to understand the reality of what that means. When I say it's not fun to talk about hell, as we're going to go through and look at the reality of hell, there are some things that you're going to recognize that are not in any way uplifting or exciting or encouraging but it's real and in order for you and I to have a proper understanding of how we need to relate to people we've got to know the reality of hell and so let's get into that I want you to start in Mark chapter 9 and in Mark chapter 9 you're going to get some encouragement from Jesus Christ to make sure you don't end up in this place of eternal punishment. Notice right there in Mark chapter 9, verse 42. If you'll read it with me. And whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it'd be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand makes you sin, cut it off, it's better for you to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now, a couple words here we need to recognize that are different from each other. In the Bible, you're going to read the word Hades. That's actually over in Acts chapter 2 in Peter's discussion of Jesus after he dies. The old King James says Jesus went to hell. And that's a mistranslation of that word Hades. That word Hades means the realm of the dead. And the realm of the dead is where every person who dies goes. This word in Mark chapter 9 is the word Gehenna. It is the tormenting place where people go when they die. If I understand it right and done some work on it, and not everybody is in total agreement with what the general scholarly opinion is on this, but here's what it looks like. That many years ago in the Old Testament, maybe you'll remember the King Josiah, who there was a valley called the Valley of Tophet. And that was where the Israelites who had decided to adopt worship to Molech had this huge valley where they would offer their children to the deity of Molech. And the Valley of Tophet means beating of the drum. And if I understand it correctly, just as I have seen pictures and illustrations of it, the valley 
came down into a V to where at the tip of the V there was a statue of Molech. This deity that was supposedly demanding your most sacred and precious sacrifice, which would be, generally speaking, your firstborn male child, if I understand it right. And this statue would be hollow, and they would put combustible materials in the back of the statue. It would be made out of bronze, and those combustible materials, coal and wood and things like that, would heat it up so it's glowing orange. And then on the outstretched arms of this glowing orange statue, as the parents walk down to give their sacrifice of their firstborn child, the drums would be on either side beating as loudly as possible to drown out the cries of the child that they were putting on that altar. Now Josiah, the king, decides he's going to put to an end all of the idolatrous practices, especially those of offering your child to Molech. And so he goes into the valley of Tophet when he becomes king and defiles it with the bones of the priest who are sacrificing children to Molech and makes it a dump to where nobody wants to build in the valley of Tophet. Can you imagine that? A valley right outside of Jerusalem that was recognized and known for human sacrifice and then Josiah going in and burning the priest's bones on top of the altars and defiling this valley so that it's good for nothing now. The valley of the sons of Hinnom, it was called if I understand it right. It's where we get the word Gehenna. And so this valley then became a, a refuse heap. It just became a dump. Now, we have some real convenient ways to get rid of our trash and to throw them in solid waste disposal places and then they know enough about how to take care of it to put it in there and then cover it over with, I think, 10 feet of clay when it's all full and it can then... Okay, in the first century, you have a valley that is the refuse valley and you drag all of your garbage there. Now, this wasn't plastic and cardboard, not that kind of garbage. This was dead dogs, and if a cow got sick or an oxen got sick, where do you put it? You drag it out to the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom because that's where nobody wants to live, and it's a refuse heap. And then to get rid of all that organic refuse, most of the time you would burn it. And so coming up from this valley would be a stench of smoke that's burning carcasses. But then when you go down, if you were to go down to the valley of the sons of Hinnom, to Gehenna, and kick over maybe one of those carcasses that's been there, you would see maggots and worms. And so that's the picture Jesus is trying, I think, if I understand it correctly, to paint for you here. If your hand causes you to sin. Now, let's step back and take a practical look at that statement. Does anybody's hand ever cause them to sin? I mean, is it the hand that's doing the sinful deciding? Jesus is not prescribing any type of self-mutilation in this point. If you cut off your right hand, what was it that decided what your right hand should have been doing or shouldn't have been doing? You missed the element of what made the decision, didn't you, if you chop off your right hand? Because you could easily probably just do it with your left now. Jesus was saying, if there is any sin in your life, that you are holding on to that would keep you away from a relationship with God and would end you up in eternal destruction, there's no sin worth that. If it was your hand, chop it off. If it's your eye, pull it out. If it's your foot, cut it off. Because there is nothing that would be worth that. And as we read it, we think, oh, textbook answer, yeah, there's nothing that would be worth that, except. How many times have we seen a person be a faithful Christian for quite some time, but get themselves in a situation where they were married, but they found somebody that they thought was better than their spouse? And so they had an affair with that person. And then as they got their divorce, they stayed with that person. And now they're with that person to have been for the last 15 years. And that's going to cost them their soul if they don't get out of it. How many years of enjoyment, physical pleasure, uh, emotional happiness, how many years would be worth an eternal 
destruction to you. 10, 20, 30. You see what Jesus is trying to say? There's no substance like alcohol that's worth it. There's no sexual relationship that's worth it. There's no amount of money that's worth it. Can you imagine a person who has accumulated billions of dollars at the end of his life and he has an opportunity to trade every dime he's ever made for his eternal soul? What did Jesus say? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? So here's what Jesus is making a statement. He's saying if you can picture being a resident of Gehenna, piled under the refuse and burning all the time with the stench that is pouring out of that valley. If you could picture that for a day, then multiply that by eternity. That's the picture you get of Jesus' description of hell. Now, some people have said, well, no, Kyle, you don't multiply that by eternity eternity because hell is not really forever. In fact, in a book called The Fire That Consumes, a man by the name of Edward Fudge says, no, hell is something that might happen for a few hundred years, maybe after this life, maybe even a few thousand, but there's no possible way that a loving God is ever going to let any person burn eternally in hell. In fact, other people even in the Lord's church have gotten on board with that teaching and said, hey, is is it as uncomfortable to you as it is me? I, I can remember the quote I've got in our article from this guy. He says, does it make you as uncomfortable as it does me to imagine a God who claims to love His people and His creation and His children, but that God would dangle a person over the eternal fire, fires of hell forever? Does that make you uncomfortable? It does to me too. And so I just don't, te I just don't think that the Bible teaches that hell is forever. Well, uh, that might make a person uncomfortable. It might make a person think, I don't know how a loving God can do that. But here's a couple things that I'll tell you. Number one, you can know for a fact that any emotion you've ever felt about a lost sinner that is one of compassion or love and concern, God has felt it an infinite times stronger and more than you have. You don't love sinners more than God loves them. And number two, you don't get to decide what the Bible says and what God says about how long hell is. God tells you. Now, there are some logical constraints as to what would happen, I believe. When God makes an immortal soul, that's what it is. It's an immortal soul. And so if it's immortal in the fact that it can live forever and will live forever, then it's immortal in the fact that it will be in hell forever. It's not an entity that has the capability of being destroyed and going into nothingness anymore. When you were born, when you were conceived and God put your immortal soul, there's a difference between something that's immortal and eternal. You understand probably the difference. Eternal, God is the only being that's eternal. And that means He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He always has been. He always will be. There was no beginning to God. He always is. That's why when you hear God describe Himself, He says, I am. Well, what does that mean? It's not I was. It's not I will be. It's I am. I've always been. When Moses asked for God's name, God said, you tell them I am sent you. Okay, that means He's just always. An eternal being, God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. God, the Trinity, is the only eternal being. An immortal soul is one that once it's created, it never goes out of existence. Every one of us has an immortal soul. And at conception, God put that immortal soul into our body. And let's see what the Bible says about the opportunity for the destination of an immortal soul. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. You'll remember, I think, the description of what's going to happen at the end of the world starts in verse 31. The Bible says that the Son of Man is going to be in judgment on every person that's ever lived. And the sheep he's going to put on his right hand, but the goats he's going to put on the left hand. And to the sheep he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servants, enter into the joys of your Lord. And they're going to say, why? And he's going to say, well, when I was hung, 
Hungry, excuse me, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was sick and in prison, you visited me. When I didn't have clothes, you... And they're going to say, when, Lord, did we see you? And he's going to say, when you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And then to the evil people, the ones who are not going to be saved. He's going to say, depart from... Well, let's just look at it. Right there in chapter 25. Verse 40. No, 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 verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left hand, the goats, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't give me drink. I was a stranger, you didn't take me in. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. Then they'll say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked and sick and in prison and did not minister to you? And as much as you didn't do it to one of these, you didn't do it to me. Now here's the verse really we need to get at for sure, although I think you can see it in that other verse. Verse 46. Now most translations of your New Testament don't do this right. They should be a little bit more consistent here. Here's the New King James. And these will go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Well, that word everlasting and that word eternal are the exact same word in this verse. So the text is saying the righteous will go into eternal life. The wicked will go into eternal destruction. However long heaven is going to be. And however long a soul will exist after it is separated from this physical body. That's how long heaven is going to be and that's how long hell is going to be. And if you are honest with what the text says about hell and heaven, and I think we all understand heaven. Every one of us I think has always understood correctly that when I die and go to be with heaven, how long is that going to last? Forever. But if you die and don't go to be with God in heaven and you go to be in the lake of fire that's prepared for the devil and his angels, how long is that going to last? Forever. And you're going to be there forever. You know, forever is a mind-boggling statement. You start thinking about forever. Uh, one of the illustrations that I have seen that is a really, really good one, especially have the, there's a guy, I'm trying to think who does it. He might not be the only one, but he's got a rope. It's a rope. It looks like a, a sailor rope. It's huge, about a two and a half inch diameter rope. And it winds all around the stage as he's talking about this rope. And on one end, it's got a white tip painted and on that white tip, it's got a red tip painted on that so that all oh, about three inches of it is two and a half, two and three quarters of it is red. And there's one little aspect of white on the tip of this rope. And then the rope goes all the way around the stage and it weaves out of the auditorium. And he says, guys, this right here is your life on earth. This little three inch segment. And this little red part is what most of us think is our working life. And many of us are working for 60 years of our life, or 55, to get to this one little white part, which is retirement. He said, but this whole aspect of this rope right here is your physical life on earth. And this is the rest of your life. Now, who would trade a tiny, brief, little amount of space on that rope for the rest of it? You know, I was at Freed Hardeman, and we had, oh, one of my favorite, favorite professors ever was Joe DeLay. Joe DeLay, I, I was in the Bible department, and I, at the time, didn't have to do a whole lot of in-depth science work. Since I've gotten out of Freed Hardman, I've done a lot more science reading and, and research and study than I did at Freed Hardman, but had his class for physical science, and he was always doing something funny. He would say, class, today we're going to... But now he, he was real quiet, and he talked kind of fast. He was, if I understand it right, 
a super genius. Uh, he was involved in making the reflective paint that is on the roads, on the lines like the yellow and white lines as you drive down the highway, and just, just genius level. And kind of, you know, your classic genius level science teacher that is a little spacey sometimes. So he would, he would describe uh, gravity, and I think I remember he had a little uh, milk carton up there, one of those little hard milk, uh, all plastic, whatever, you know. Okay, work with him. But anyway, he stood up on it. And he said, class, today we're going we're gonna to do a little experiment on gravity. And he would hop off of it. And he said, did y'all catch that? Let's try it again. Get back on it. Hop off on it. He said, and that's what gravity's all about. And then you were thinking, is that, is that the lesson? And it would be. He'd move right on to the next subject. Well, he got up one day. as I, Now, this was fascinating because I got the rest of this story later. I, I have told this for years. I was talking to somebody, and they said, yeah, well, let me tell you how Joe DeLay talked to us about infinity and then ultimately eternity. He got a marker, and this was back when you had blackboards. said he started right here on the edge of the blackboard. He said, guys, we're going to be talking about eternity. This is what it looks like. Went all the way across the blackboard, got to here. This is now the wall. Went on the wall. Walked down the steps, went around, got to that door, walked out. Class sat there for 10 minutes. <laughs> Literally. Now, this was the rest of the story. All I knew was he walked out. Had a lady come up to me afterward and say, me and one other girl were the only ones who stayed in class. And here's what happened. He walked out the door all the way around the school for like 10 or 15 minutes. Everybody else got him and left. They thought, where'd he go? He comes back in this door over here, drawn on the wall, comes in, puts the line back right there and says, that's about what eternity is. Walks out. I didn't even see the class. I wasn't even in it, and I remember it. Pretty good illustration, wasn't it? Can you imagine eternity? You know, there's been all kinds of things to, to identify or to try to help you relate to eternity. Like if a tiny ant walked around the equator of the globe for so long that that ant actually wore a little trail around the entire earth, and then kept walking one ant around the entire earth and not only wore a trail, but it went an inch deep and then two inches and three inches. By the time that that ant went all the way through planet earth, if he even could, once he got to the mantle and the magma and stuff like that, if he even could, that would not be one second of time in eternity. The other one that I've heard is if you have a dove that comes down and can fly somehow through space to get to the moon, it's 240,000 miles, and that dove comes down and picks up one grain of sand and flies it to the moon and drops it off and flies back and picks up one more grain of sand and flies it to the moon and drops it off and one more grain of sand and flies it to the moon and does that for all the East Coast beaches and all the West Coast beaches and all the beaches on the Caribbean and every beach in the world, every single grain of sand. And then once all of those are moved to the moon, that dove starts again and brings them all back. You haven't touched a second of eternity. It's eternity. Now, we don't have the time to go through the the justification for how a loving God can allow a person to go to hell for all eternity when they only spend 50, 60 years on this planet rejecting Him. Uh, the simple statement that I think we can understand very well is that a crime is never related, the punishment is never related to how long it takes to commit a crime. Somebody walks into a gas station, pulls out a pistol, shoots five people. It takes them 37 seconds. What will our lawmakers and jurors often do for that person? Number one, if it's in a state that allows the death penalty, lots of times they will assign the death penalty to that. If it's not, they'll put them in jail for 900 plus years with no opportunity at parole. 
Well, hold on, it only took 37 seconds. You understand that the punishment for a crime is never commensurate to how long it took. It's commensurate to how devastating the crime is. And how devastating is it? Well, I think you and I both understand this. That if only one of us in this auditorium tonight had committed only one sin and the rest of us had never sinned at all. Jesus Christ would have come down from heaven to die on the cross for that one person to forgive that one sin. What's the cost of a life in rejection to God? The life of His Son, Jesus. That's how much it costs. Now, lots of times the skeptic will rail against God and say, well, I can't believe a loving God will throw people into hell. Do you know in a very real sense God doesn't throw anyone into hell? Oh, ultimately the mechanics of it are that at the end of time when a person's soul separates from his or her body and that wicked person's soul is assigned to hell, yes, in, in some technical ways God does that. But you'll remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, I believe. There in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, where Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for broad is the gate, and wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many people go in by it, but narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are only a few people who find it. You'll also, I think, remember the statement that Peter wrote to us when he said, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What does God want for every single person in this world? He just wants them in heaven. That's all He wants. But because God is a God that is a loving God, love always allows a person to choose. Love cannot force obedience and it cannot force a loving response. And in a very real sense, any time a person decides to go to the broad way, God says, I love you enough to let you do that. C.S. Lewis said, hell is God's greatest monument to human freedom. But God hasn't left the way open to a person. And let me tell you what I mean. I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. And when I mean He hasn't left the way open... I mean, he's done everything he can, everything that love can possibly accomplish to, co not to, to persuade, to lovingly show, to get a person to see how much he, they mean to their Creator. I want you to look right there in verse 29 of Hebrews chapter 10. It's talking about how when a person in the Old Testament committed a crime that was worthy of death, like adultery. They were stoned or sometimes burned to death because of that crime. And then here's what the text says, verse 29, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. Now you've got to kind of force yourself to see the picture that the Hebrews writer is painting right there. You've got the narrow way that's going to life. You've got the broad way that's going to destruction. And right in the center of the broad way are the outstretched arms of Jesus Christ saying to every sinner who chooses that, I love you so much, I'll die for you. And the Hebrews writer says, if you choose to reject God, you are trampling the crucified Son of God, Jesus Christ, with your feet, his blood underneath the path that you're taking and counting the blood of the covenant 
as nothing. You don't care. God has said, I will let you go to hell over my dead body. And you know what most people are saying? Fine. I'll trample your dead body and not think a thing about it. And it won't faze me a bit because I'm going to do what I want to do. And we have a God who is loving and a God who is just and who has begged people to respond to his love. But one thing he will never do, never, is force you to love him back. And if you decide that you want something more than you want a relationship with God, God will let you have it. But understand that everything that's good, everything that's wholesome, everything that's encouraging and loving, everything that's kind and nice, everything that you have ever had a pleasant memory of comes from God. And every aspect of pain and suffering and torment and guilt and fear and destruction is something you experience outside of God. And if you separate yourself from God, all that's left is torment. Can you imagine a person staring at the crucified Jesus Christ knowing that that, that sacrifice was for them and then saying, them saying, I don't care and literally walking over the dead body of Jesus to get where they wanted to go? Spiritually, that's what God says happens every time a person chooses not to be with Him. So, the question to you, and it's always been, you know the only person responsible for your soul and your eternal destination. One person that's responsible for that. It's not God. It's not Satan. Neither one of those two entities. Satan doesn't have the power to. God, because of His love, would never force you to go anywhere. There's one person responsible for your eternal destination. That's you. You and you alone. Have you accepted the responsibility for where your soul will be eternally? And are you living with eternity in mind? Are you going to heaven? You know what's disturbing to me? And I'm going to leave you with this. Several times we've passed out surveys in teen classes or adult classes that I've read the results of. Do you know in, in virtually every survey where you put this question, yes, I'm going to heaven. I don't know if I'm going to heaven. I know I'm going to hell. 50% of people put, I don't know if I'm going to heaven. And many, many times there's about a 10 to 15% population in any church that I've ever seen those surveys done that say, I know I'm going to hell. Can you imagine a person walking out of this assembly tonight that if we pass that survey out and they marked, I know I'm going to hell, not getting that right, not changing their eternal destination? If you were to write that, yes, I know I'm going to heaven. My brethren, these things we write to you that you may know you have eternal life, 1 John chapter 5. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. You know what that mean, means? I might not be. But then, I know I'm not. Is there any person in this auditorium that needs to make a life change that they need to get right with their Creator? We singing an invitation <laughs> song. If you need to do that, what is stopping you from making sure that you could say, yes, I know I'm going to heaven. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, I hope you will as we stand and as we sing.